Good morning, everyone from Singapore. Hello to everyone else tuning from all over the uh, all over the world. Welcome to today's session on hydrogen for a low carbon future. My name is Wei Min, and for those who may know, SG Innovate is a government-backed deep tech investor and company builder whose mission is to help entrepreneurial scientists build deep tech startups that are looking to solve big global problems. Our work also involves building a global community of leaders, thinkers, and doers to drive and scale up deep tech innovations in areas such as AI, healthcare, quantum tech, and autonomous technology across various industries. I am sure the topic of being green and sustainable is not new to everyone here. In fact, I believe it's one of the hottest topics this year as Singapore maps up the Green Plan 2030. In this digital age, almost everything we do require energy of some sort, and it is important to look at how we can use energy responsibly and sustainably in order to cut greenhouse emissions and reducing Singapore carbon footprint. The potential of hydrogen as a form of clean energy thus holds a huge potential. It's important to understand what are its various means of application and uses to bring about a low carbon future. Which brings us to, to the topic today, where our speakers will discuss more about the importance of hydrogen and its potential to meet the world's energy needs. We encourage for our attendees to share with us your thoughts on the topic or interact with our speakers by posting your questions in the Q&A tab located at the bottom panel of your screen. Otherwise, feel free to just say hi or do a quick shout out from where you are in the chat box below. With no further ado, do allow me to pass the time to Tong Xian Hui, Executive Director of Investments at SG Innovate to start the session. Xian Hui, please. Okay, thank you very much, Wei Min, and thank you very much to all of you to, for joining us today. I'm going to say a few words first to uh, sort of try to frame the discussion that's going to come later uh, around the whole issue of sustainable energy and hydrogen. Now, I think a lot of the impetus behind the push towards sustainable energy is driven really by the simple fact that, you know, environmental concerns aside, you know, the world is likely to run out of fossil fuel somewhere in the 2060s. That, de that date is actually near enough to represent an existential threat to us if we continue to rely upon such fuels to power our lives and economy. But switching from a source of energy that has powered industry for at least the last 200 years is really not easy. It is perhaps not an exaggeration to say that our infrastructure and economy has been built around you know, optimizing the entire process of extraction, refining, generation, transmission, uh, distribution, and even consumption of the fossil fuels. So finding a replacement to fossil fuels needs to really broadly address the following three areas. The first is for grid scale electricity generation. Uh, here is where there are already several viable alternatives to consider. Uh, energy sources like wind, solar, hydroelectric, thermoelectric and nuclear all have large scale installations in different parts of the world that actually show them to be part of a solution to replace fossil fuels for electricity generation. Uh, the second, obviously, is byproducts from the refining of fossil fuels and other hydrocarbons. Materials we use on a day-to-day -day basis like plastics, construction materials, lubricants, solvents, wax, fertilizers, so on and so forth. There are already organic options for each that are biodegradable and sustainable, uh, although really their cost is higher than materials derived simply because uh, you know, there's an issue of scale. The third and final one is the one that we're going to speak about today, and that's about portable energy. And that is the energy that goes into machines such as cars, planes, ships, etc. This represents the biggest challenge in that, you know, there's no real simple solution to this problem. We are seeing a strong push for electric vehicles and a heavy investment in its supporting ecosystem. Uh, but its success is really uh, sort of predicated on a clean source of energy producing the electricity. And at the same time, you know, technology has not reached a stage yet where electric uh, passenger planes or container vessels are uh, practical due to the size and weight of batteries and the uh, capacitors. Another option, ethanol, uh, has also been used as an alternative, but the discussions and debates around there come more on the lines of the food and fuel debate because it is primarily derived from corn. Now, hydrogen is often considered the most promising of these options because of its high energy density and because it produces zero emissions. According to the International Energy Agency, the global demand for hydrogen has tripled within the last four decades and remains uh, you know, 
growing at the same pace. With policies and solutions around the world focusing on or favoring hydrogen as a fuel, we are now at a time where countries and companies are looking to invest in infrastructure and technology to bring costs down, such as to increase consumer and commercial adoption. Locally in Singapore, the government plans to halve its peak greenhouse emissions by 2050, uh, taking on multiple approaches towards transitioning to cleaner fuels. But there remain technological and infrastructural challenges for the mass adoption of hydrogen as a go-to energy source in the country. Today's session seeks to discuss the potential and challenges of a low carbon future powered by hydrogen, as well as possible applications of hydrogen in Singapore. I'm therefore extremely pleased to have three very distinguished guests with me today to share their thoughts on the topic. Uh, they are Mr. Ong Kim Pong, Regional CEO, Southeast Asia for PSA International, Mr. Xia King Bun, Head of Advanced Engineering and Technology at SEMCOP, Mr. Taras Frankovic, Founder, Horizon Fuel Cell Technologies, H3 Dynamics and HGS Energy Systems. Now, before we go into the discussion proper, I'd like to invite our panelists to share a little bit more about themselves and what they do. Uh, perhaps uh, we can start uh, with Kim Pong. Okay. Thanks, uh, Xianhui, uh, for a very, very interesting uh, introduction about uh, hydrogen as an important uh, factor going forward. Uh, I'm Kim Pong from uh, PSA International. So let me give a very quick uh, overview of uh, PSA. Since our corporatization almost uh, a quarter of a century ago, and time really flies, uh, PSA has actually become a leading international seaport operator by equity count. In fact, our global network um, encompasses over 50 locations in 26 countries around the world. So besides seaports, we have also invested, especially in the last couple of years, and managed uh, real and inland terminals, as well as affiliated businesses like district parks, warehouses, marine uh, services. And uh, as I mentioned, in the past five years, we have also positioned ourselves within the whole supply chain through inland nodes like in China, in India, and even in the States for a deeper fiscal flow of uh, the, the cargo. And this is also further twinned with a digital flow across the network that we operate in. So with regards to uh, PSA's ESG framework, we have actually pledged to meet Tomasic's uh, ABC framework. Uh, a for active and productive economies, uh, B for a beautiful and inclusive society, and C for a clean and cool earth. And uh, we'll be talking about hydrogen today, and it is indeed part of a holistic approach that we are adopting in reducing our carbon uh, emissions. Thanks. Uh, over back to you, uh, Xianhui. Thanks, Kim Pong. Uh, uh, maybe Kang Boon, you can go next. Yep, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Xianhui. And nice to see you, uh, Kim Pong and Taras, in this session. A uh, little bit background for, of what I'm coming from. I'm from Semcorp Industries. Uh, we are a Singapore company listed in SGX and majority of our activities sur is surrounding energy sector. So we generate electrons and then uh, send it to our customer to use them. We also provide energy solutions based on our urban development that we have various presence in uh, 11 countries that currently are still counting. Hopefully we will expand further. And we are mainly uh, uh, still a thermal com uh, uh, operating uh, generation company where we generate uh, use natural gas as well as coal, but we are moving towards green energy. So that's our process in the process of from the transform from a brown to green currently. Uh, meanwhile, our motto of the company since our new CEO Kim Min come to Semcorp last year, uh, our motto is sustainability is our business. So we are putting a lot of effort to further expand our green sector. So you can see much uh, information on news recently in the past even two, three months time where we are cooking a lot of uh, solar, uh, wind, uh, uh, farm uh, business as well as projects. We are also uh, pushing out our first so-called fresh water floating PV in Singapore, largest in Singapore, uh, 60 megawatt as soon as possible within the Q2. Uh, and as for myself, I'm Sia, I'm leading the advanced engineering and technology in SEMCOP, where what we are doing is 
uh, looking at various technology to develop together with the stakeholder uh, as well as uh, conduct R&D together with the stakeholder in order to adopt and push new technology that is greener into the market. Thank you. Thanks, Kang Boon. And uh, last, obviously, but not least, uh, Taras. <clears throat> Taras, I think you have it on mute. Thanks, everyone, for welcoming me to this event. Um, so I'm Taras. I'm the founder of several uh, companies, um, and the first of which was started 20 years ago in the hydrogen space uh, with the ambition to, uh, to, let's say, break the conundrum in hydrogen commercialization. We, um, I'm originally French. Um, I, I co-founded Horizon Fuel Cell Technologies with a Shanghainese uh, colleague. Uh, we were working at Eastman Chemical in the past. Um, and the EDB invited us to start this company in Singapore. Um, and we basically built out um, a vertically integrated uh, hydrogen fuel cell company uh, in Asia uh, with a very unique approach to uh, entering the market, uh, starting with very small and simple products and moving our way up over 20 years uh, into increasingly difficult, complex, uh, highly regulated uh, you know, applications. Um, I'm glad to say that Horizon is currently um, Singapore's only uh, hydrogen or clean tech unicorn. It has achieved the status recently with um, one of its carve outs, uh, which is Hyzon Motor, which is listing on NASDAQ at a valuation of $2.7 billion um, and is now considered one of the world leaders in um, the bringing hydrogen heavy vehicles to market. A lot of experience built out of, of China uh, through Horizon, which has already put several hundred heavy vehicles on the road. Um, and the company is working globally um, in Europe, uh, manufacturing trucks in Europe, manufacturing trucks in New York, um, starting the biggest um, uh, MEA uh, material plants in the US uh, at the moment, and also starting uh, activities in Australia and New Zealand. Um, for my part, I'm in Singapore since 2011 and uh, have been focused primarily on the air mobility branch or the air mobility version of Hyzon Motor um, to try to bring hydrogen into uh, passenger aviation. That's my ultimate goal, okay? But with a similar long road, which is to start with small applications and move my way up uh, through the, the painstaking journey of what it takes to bring hydrogen to market. Okay, so that's my uh, summary. Hey, thanks, Taras. Uh, just a housekeeping for those uh, in the audience who wish to uh, ask questions. Uh, please write those questions into the Q&A uh, section at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll go through it and obviously you can upvote it if you feel that you, know, you want that question to be answered. Uh, and then I will post that question to the panelists uh, towards the end of the session. Okay, uh, so let's just jump straight into the, uh, the panel proper. Now, the first question I have actually is for all of you. I know as senior leaders and veterans in your respective industry, could you perhaps share with us some of your observations on the usage of different fuel sources in your industry? And has there really been a shift in policies or frameworks uh, towards more sustainable uh, energy use extraction, uh, you know, uh, transmission over the last uh, few years? Uh, maybe uh, King Boon, I can ask you that question first because I think you've seen quite a bit of that in your own industry. Yeah, sure. So maybe I can share a little bit more on the energy sector or power generations. So maybe before that is 20 years ago and so um, due to electrifications of uh, power sector and also proliferations of electrons to even the wider range of the community, um, cheapest fuel uh, is always the first choice. That's where the coal is coming in. And then 20 years ago, we start to shift into the natural gas, at least for Singapore, right? Um, still, the electrification is still happening in a very past phase in order to ensure that uh, more and more uh, communities, the people around the developing or developed countries enjoying clean or uh, at least uh, sustainable electrification. Um, of course, then come the EV and there's even more and faster in the last few years 
where we can, are observing these electrifications. But having said that, the few in terms of uh, coming from the thermal did not reduce substantially, especially from the coal. As per 2020, in fact, uh, there is an increase of 1.7% of, uh, of energy coming from coal worldwide. All right, and we still see substantial uh, new installation of the coal power plant as much as 38, 39 gigawatt last year alone, right? Then in the, in, besides, besides this uh, field that is still, uh, we are still using a lot of coal as a you know, humanity in, 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 on the earth here. There are a lot of effort that we are shifting from this dirty or black electrons that we are talking about into a more greener, be it uh, to natural gas or to uh, renewable. And that is mainly driven by decarbonization effort from various countries. And in this case, uh, the key drivers of uh, how to ensure that decarbonization is happening, that include policy. So we have seen fit in tariff policy from some, from some country. We have seen carbon tax is implemented. Uh, financially, you also can see that even, in fact, uh, just this trick, uh, we, 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 in order to make a project more bank, uh, bankable, for example, credit ratings is very important for companies like us or many other uh, power uh, project developers. But um, there is a, a conscious effort from various uh, uh, credit rating uh, agencies, including S&P, Global, Moody's, as well as Fitch, where they are pushing down the credit, credit ratings for those uh, uh, countries that have uh, not having a clear policy or clear decarbonization effort and continue using the, the uh, uh, fuel source. And that is pushing more and more uh, countries towards the cleaner fuel source. Besides that, there are two more very critical uh, uh, factors that pushing all this change of the fuel from the towards a cleaner fuel as well as a, a renewable energy. That is due to one, energy security policy as well as technological improvement. We have seen um, uh, the proliferations of solar and wind, and that is mainly due to a very high learning rate that we are seeing in the past 10 years. From 2010 to 2020, we have seen a learning rate as high as 35% for solar and 19% for uh, uh, a win. And that means that the, the leverage cost of electricity actually keep pushing down by using the renewable, moving away from dependence of the so-called traditional uh, coal or, or even natural gas. Uh, having said that, uh, just now I touched a little bit on the driver where uh, the, the energy security is, is actually very important worldwide. And that is how a uh, greener, so-called, even though it's not as green, but it's still greener uh, energy that is a uh, liquid natural gas, where uh, the proliferation of bringing the cheaper uh, liquid natural gas to some countries that are lacking of green energy or green resources, all right, including Singapore. So these are the few drivers and we have seen a huge move uh, from coal to natural gas and recently obviously it's all the green greener support with uh, uh, resources uh, uh, coming into our sector and cheaper and cheaper so that the rest of the community is able to enjoy the true electrification with a greener energy. Thanks Kang Boon. Um, Kim Pong, what about yourself uh, in PSA? I mean, as a port operator, you must see a lot of uh, different types of energy sources being used to power, you know, the, the variety of uh, vehicles, containers, cranes, and all that in your in your, in your business. Indeed, indeed. Uh, thanks, uh, Sin. We, in fact, um, Kim Boon actually shared a very, very interesting uh, approach towards uh, electrification. So I, I will share from the um, industry perspective as a user, mm -hmm and as a use case uh, uh, anger. So closer to home, say PSA Singapore, we actually aim to reduce our carbon intensity emission on absolute uh, emission basis by 50%. Uh, in fact, it's supposed to be 10 years from now, but it's already passed forward to 2021, so it's nine years from now, by 2030. So in the past, the port equipment, like the yacht cranes, the horizontal transport, like the prime movers, predominantly run on diesel. Indeed, electrification is actually one of our key pathway to actually decarbonize. 
In fact, our latest Pas Panjang terminal, uh, we call it Terminal 4 to 6, which is just uh, right outside of the, uh, now they call it the M-Tower or the PSA corporate building. The entire fleet of the uh, rail-mounted gantry cranes are electrified and even automated. Mm. So PSA Singapore is now in the process of electrifying and automating all our diesel rubber tire gantries in the other older terminals uh, be it in Paspanjang or be it in uh, the city uh, side. And eventually, when TWAS is developed, all the container handling equipment, including the AGVs, will be fully electrified. In fact, uh, today, uh, the PSA Singapore's uh, consumption of uh, energy is actually almost 430 giga gigawatts hour of uh, uh, electricity on an annual basis. And frankly speaking, the electrification actually covers quite a fair bit of scope one. To me, that's a uh, powerful cause. It is where we can look into also scope two reduction. And this is something that we are working uh, closely with um, uh, various uh, like-minded uh, agencies and parties to look at battery energy storage system because we are going to have uh, a number of AGVs running as well as a smart grid to see a reduction in the use of energy, even though after we have done electrification. But again, that is also uh, about scope two. Uh, eventually, we need to go into uh, scope three. How do we influence upstream, downstream? How do we find a totally uh, vector that can really look at the uh, carbon neutral position? So in GIS, from PSAs as industry uh, uh, anger, we actually have a three-prong environmental sustainability effort. So first, um, while we are actually constructing the TWAS port, we have actually uh, uh, look and going to uh, focus on sustainable construction because I think everybody knows cement is actually one of the biggest uh, carbon uh, emitter of uh, uh, carbon. Uh, and uh, we have actually uh, incorporated with a, a lower uh, carbon footprint construction with also again the number of uh, industry and that's the first thing. Second thing is that uh, we are looking at energy management such as smart grid or battery energy as a storage system in order to reduce the total consumption uh, perspective and finally we definitely need to look for low carbon alternatives. Yes uh, LNG is a transitional fuel and then the future of uh, energy hydrogen is going to be an important uh, factor. Uh, thank you very much. Didn't we? Yeah, thanks, Kim Pong. And uh, Taras, I think uh, you have had the front uh, front row seat in this whole uh, transition, uh, given the, the the startup that you have and uh, adoption of, and to see how how widely industry is adopting uh, hydrogen from the very early days, when probably no one was even interested to talk to you, to now where uh, you now are sitting uh, you know, with a unicorn in your portfolio. I think uh, you probably are best to tell us how. Has this evolved since the days uh, you know when you first started your company? Yeah, we've we've had many ups and downs. We've had many successes and failures also. So within the whole electrification context, um, we've learned to find the right uh, applications for hydrogen, um, because hydrogen is not uh, the be all end all solution to all electrification uh, applications. And this is a you know twenty years in the making. So. We know, for example, that there is a, a very strong advantage of using hydrogen in heavy vehicle applications uh, with a hub and spoke model. Um, ports are definitely a very important part of this. Uh, as we know, trucks uh, and heavy vehicles circulate um, in ports, uh, including in Singapore, quite intensively. One solution for Singapore's decarbonization may be that one day there's a sign at the TUAS entry point that says by 2030, no more diesel trucks allowed into Singapore, right? And uh, that would be an easy way to decarbonize the, uh, the whole logistics space over here. But uh, as I said, there are several, there are several useful uh, niche applications for hydrogen, heavy trucks and buses, uh, back to base type operations to reduce the strain on infrastructure, um, in the uh, air mobility side where I'm involved, we have a completely different value proposition where um, uh, when you talk about um, flying platforms 
uh, using batteries is heavier, much heavier than batteries. So the range limitations of electric flight uh, have something to do with the choice of technology. Um, and so hydrogen is coming in to basic, basically open up uh, flight duration and range of such zero emission aircraft, uh, which the world is now starting to uh, embrace. Thanks, Taras. I think, uh, you know, listening to the feedback from all three of the panelists, obviously policy is one of the key barriers or key enablers of this uh, push towards a sustainable energy such as hydrogen and others. Uh, so, but, you know, when we talk about hydrogen energy in and of itself, uh, you know, what do you believe are other key barriers to mass adoption of uh, you know, hydrogen energy globally? Uh, and maybe, Taras, I will ask you that question first, uh, given that, you know, you have probably more intimate knowledge of the inner workings of hydrogen uh, you know, development. I would say uh, it's always been a, a hydrogen supply challenge, okay? And it's been a kind of chicken and the egg challenge. You know, the hydrogen applications or the, the mobility applications uh, cannot exist uh, easily without uh, a ready hydrogen supply and vice versa. Hydrogen supply needs, uh, you know, to find an offtake. Um, so those two things need to work together. Um, we've, uh, we've found over the years um, that partnerships between the supply side and the demand side are necessary to start uh, the motion forward. And so even in the Hyzon story um, and their uh, introduction of um, hydrogen heavy vehicles, uh, they're working with a lot of customers today that already have uh, ready access to hydrogen to begin implementation of these uh, transport modes and basically grow from there. Um, so infrastructure and the cost of hydrogen obviously uh, are important, but we, we know that this cost of hydrogen is, re is going down, okay? Um, capacity is going up. We saw what happened also with the solar PV industry over the last 20 years. When we started, Horizon PV was extremely expensive at that time. Today, we all know the cost of electricity from solar uh, is very low. We expect hydrogen to also drop its, uh, its uh, cost, especially as it migrates into uh, green forms of hydrogen production, which we're all very interested in. Thanks, Taras. Uh, Kim Pong, your opinion on the barriers to, to hydrogen adoption? Um, thanks, uh, CNB. In fact, I just wanted to um, address a point that Taras uh, brought up uh, in mm -hmm. his uh, earlier discussion about regulatory uh, framework. Uh, while we see hydrogen as a solution, uh, we need to see the overall ecosystem of uh, this uh, energy management. Mm. Because a very important thing is actually the carbon tax. Uh, various uh, economies and uh, various uh, jurisdictions is actually having different level of carbon tax uh, at this moment now. And also uh, carbon uh, trading exchange uh, uh, facilitation. Because that is actually a very key component on how the needle is being moved in uh, various uh, economies and various parties. And, and in this use of a new energy factor, be it hydrogen or any other thing, we need to have a full uh, upstream, downstream uh, network uh, be in place. And many organizations do apply the MACC, the, mar the marginal abatement uh, cost curve. Mm -hmm. And that carbon uh, pricing and how carbon is being traded can swing the left-hand side and right-hand side quite fast and quite substantially. So, so that is actually quite uh, important. In fact, uh, Taras actually brought up that point. So I thought I uh, just wanted to reinforce uh, with uh, my uh, perspective on that. Okay. Thanks, Kim Pong. Um, Kim Boon? Yep. Um, so I, I, will, I will talk about the global sphere first. So I totally agree with Taras um, from the sub and also what Kim Pong has mentioned in terms of uh, the supply chain periphery, right? So in terms of the supply chain, yes, um, everyone in the supply chain need to play a role. So Taras has already uh, mentioned about the, the fuel cell trucks and so on, but there's a lack of the H2 or green H2 supply. And uh, typically there's a, again, a totally agree chicken and egg, uh, because uh, when we were to look at, everyone will be looking at coal, right? When we look at the cost of the H2 and the cost of the natural gas, uh, even um, that, that's still very far away. Right. But however, if we were to look at from the uh, 
uh, total cost of ownership point of view. That means you look at the value of the total supply chain of the lifespan of uh, owning an equipment or a, a set or even a truck and so on. Maybe it's no longer just looking at the cost of the history supply. So the, the community or the, 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 the supply chain players uh, should work together to look at it in the totality. Right? That's one. At the global stage as well, um, so there are a lot of interesting technology, you know, keep coming, popping out from uh, various locations, be it from US, UK, Singapore itself as well. Um, so how, how can uh, industrial players, including uh, St. Paul, PSA, we work together, come together in one of the MOU last year. So our role in the supply chain should include also how to encourage these new ideas to bring them up from the lab scale or from the brain, from someone, from the idea to a lab, to a test bathing level, and then commercialize it. Uh, and that, that, that kind of visions of uh, working backward from the commercialization of that vision and backward is very important because uh, um, a lot of time when we were to look at the, the uh, supply chain point of view, there's always one or two pieces that's missing. So that's why uh, the consortium-like kind of uh, approach is very uh, important because uh, if we are able to have various parties playing in this uh, supply chain, that will encourage this whole community of this H2 economy will grow together and reduce the cost and further push up this learning rate or learning curve that we are having now to emulate the similar things that what we have seen in solar, wind, or in fact, uh, uh, battery energy storage. And then come to Singapore, in Singapore context, meanwhile, uh, there's still a lacking of natural resources. If you were to look at the number, by 2025, we are talking about two gigawatt peak, right? You can't move a needle. You can't, not even a 10% of uh, energy usage in Singapore. Even we fast forward to 2050, all right, with all the uh, different technology coming into play, working together, implement it, we are still looking at a number, yes, sounds huge, 8.6 gigawatt, gigawatt peak as a, a indicated a study by a service, but it's still very small portion, right? 20% max based on our simulation, right? Out of that 10 gigawatt that we need uh, within Singapore itself. So that, there is a limitation, there's a hurdle that we are facing from the natural resources point of view. Not only Singapore, there are some other countries as well. So what can we do? So again, we should tap on some of the technology outside Singapore or resources outside Singapore to bring into the Singapore. And that's also uh, means that there's another supply chain that we need to look at when it comes to uh, transportation of hydrogen. And last but not least is for Singapore specifically, um, uh, the, the technology like uh, carbon capture for producing H2 is, is there, it's not new, right? And the cost actually is not as bad as importing H2 if you were to look at the number correctly, right? However, why we are not still not able to do it? A lot of time is uh, where can we use our CO2, right? If we were to uh, bring it to somewhere else, I'm, I'm, in this case, I'm talking about blue uh, hydrogen, then that we also face some geopolitical constraints. And that's where uh, the supply chain cannot uh, just depends on the this supply chain. Then we have to start looking at different level, the agencies level, the government level, the G2G, uh, the international effort to work together on this. And there's another hurdle that um, we need to overcome from industry point of view, from community point of view. Okay. Thanks, King Boon. And uh, perhaps I will just stay with you and perhaps expand a little bit on what you have just said about having a community to build, you know, to get those innovations out from the lab into the market, which I believe Taras uh, encountered the same challenges when he did his startup. Um, what role would an organization, a, a, a big organization like SEMCORP, uh, which does a lot of engineering projects, uh, play in that particular role? Would it be at the later stage or would you actually want to be involved at the very early stage? 
Um, actually, um, from from our perspective, perspective, right, and um, actually we can play really a, a few roles in various uh, uh, supply chain. The way I look at it, I always look at it in the supply chain point of view, from generation all the way to the demand side, and from the technology vertical or enabler point of view, definitely uh, we we can play even bigger roles. So that is something that we are actively engaged with the R and D community locally and overseas as well as the tech company as much as possible, right? So in terms of the supply demand, obviously we, we are generating electrons. We are happy to work with uh, the, the, the tech company or R&D or professor that you know, come up with various type of fuel cell catalytics, new catalysts to, to, to develop, uh, to, to generate cheaper, greener, faster uh, 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 electrons. And then from the demand side, uh, obviously, we, we, we do, if from power power generation point of view, we do face certain constraints because the, 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 the cost parity, unfortunately, is based on the MMBQ, it's at energy level. But uh, uh, fortunately, from SEMCOR point of view, we are in this utility supply chain network as well in Jurong Island, for example. So we are not restricted just the power generation. Actually, we are also engaged with petrochemical company where our clients are uh, 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 in Jurong Island, right? So this is another role that we can uh, be the connector, be the network within that uh, community or that supply chain. Third, obviously uh, we have a plan, we have operation. That's where test bedding is able to be conducted. So that is something that we are actively uh, uh, looking at potential test bidding, but the test bidding may not necessarily is within the SEMCOP space. It can be also uh, working with our, our uh, like-minded partner like PSA, the Ping Pong Group, where uh, we are looking at opportunity to test bid of some of the technology together with uh, the partner like uh, PSA. And last but not least is obviously is um, uh, working with the government, right, uh, in terms of the policy and and be the connector to some of the, and to encourage, because currently Singapore, unfortunately, we still do not have hydrogen strategy. Germany have it, Japan already have it, um, Australia have announced it, right? But uh, we are yet to have that strategy, right? We are waiting for the roadmap to come and announce it. And then based on that, hopefully we are able to uh, participate and encourage that strategy to be put in place. And then last but not least is always the awareness. All right, so this awareness is extremely important because whenever you talk to uh, a lot of our partners or potential partners or users of H2, immediately they think about two things, uh, the disaster caused by Hedenberg and also H2 bomb, right? But they have forgotten that uh, uh, we in Singapore actually have been sleeping with all the H2 pipe together with the town gas. 40 to 60% of uh, H2 uh, or of the, our town gas consists of H2, right? So this community, uh, this awareness, once everyone understands that so long as there is a proper process, together with all this technology and the proliferation of uh, more and more uh, uh, development, R&D and, and this consortium-like kind of uh, collaboration, I believe that we are able to push more and more new ideas, new technology into the market adopted by various parties in the supply chain. Okay, thanks, Kim Boon. Uh, Kim Pong, you, you wanted to say something? Yeah, thanks, uh, Sien Wei, uh, for giving me the, the time. Um, I like what Kim Boon said uh, about this uh, importance of collaborating together. In fact, uh, Taras also mentioned about this in order for startup to actually get uh, going. We definitely need like-minded stakeholders getting together to actually demonstrate that there's a robust plan. Uh, while we are discussing about hydrogen as a low carbon future today, I just wanted to share an immediate story that just happened last week, whereby we actually had our very first LNG bunkering in Asia. And it happens in Singapore, and it happens in the PSA port in Singapore. Uh, not only we actually did the LNG, and we know that LNG is a transitional field, not only we did the LNG bunkering, we actually do simultaneous operations while the bunkering is happen, happening. Because um, understanding the vector is actually very important because it has some risk assessment uh, to, to be managed. And similarly, for hydrogen, it is, it is a 
an, a vector that we are still understanding, we're still studying, and uh, we mentioned about the upstream, downstream, and uh, the midstream also, the upstream of uh, extraction, storage, and then the midstream of uh, transportation, and then bunkering, plus simultaneous ops in a maritime uh, perspective, and then the downstream, how we actually can apply it to some of the mobility uh, uh, equipment like the trucks and things like this. So it is actually quite key to have this collaborative effort, to have sandboxes, and to have the trials, and to make it a success. And we really have to really believe in it to see it, because if we are putting a lot of barriers even before the thing comes along, this is going to be a long drawn and we can't afford to make this a long drawn. We have to make it fast and uh, find this uh, hydrogen uh, as a vector sooner than later. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Kempong. Uh, Taras, I'm going to, because uh, you, have, you have actually worked on hydrogen, can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, as an entrepreneur in, this, in that budding space? And what has your experience been working with investors uh, and other stakeholders within the ecosystem. Okay, so yeah, and, and I've been in Singapore for quite some time. Um, it's um, it's not been easy, I would say, in in this part of the world, in Singapore anyway, to talk about uh, hydrogen hardware uh, technologies in general or deep tech in general. I would say, uh, relative to other more favored areas of technology, such as uh, digitization, e-commerce, fintech, uh, which seem to be uh, preferred, I would say, as technology spaces within Singapore, simply because Singapore over the years has shifted its model away from manufacturing and into the knowledge economy. So um, as a hydrogen uh, technology company, we had to go global uh, right away um, and, and find our audiences where, where they were. So um, Horizon has raised capital uh, everywhere but Singapore, I would say, um, over, over the years. Um, so has Hyzon Motor and then A Street Dynamics, um, almost the same story. I can't say anything yet, but we, we, uh, we do have an, in, an increased interest from Singapore simply because at A Street Dynamics, my starting point is in the digitization space. So just for that factor, I was able to, uh, to get support um, you know, and actually adjust my, my storyline uh, to my audience, right? If I didn't do that, I don't think I would ever be progressing, uh, unfortunately, uh, unless I would change my audience, meaning uh, you know, go and, and find investors in the US or Europe or Japan. In fact, um, a Street Dynamics is at the tail end of its B round. Its B round is led by a Japanese uh, investor, which is basically a partnership between Toyota, uh, Sumitomo Banking Corporation, and an asset management uh, company called Sparks. And they invest in hydrogen, AI, and robotics, which is exactly what A Street Dynamics is doing. But I had to go get them in Japan. Um, such investors don't exist in Singapore. Um, and that makes it a little bit challenging for companies like ours to, uh, to build and grow capability over here. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't innovate from here or organize our, our global uh, strategies from Singapore and learn from, from the entire um, you know, global ecosystem. Now, for example, we talked about ports uh, with Kim Pong. You know, um, Haizan Motors is already working closely with European ports in Barcelona, in Antwerp, in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam. Um, although it's uh, kind of, its history stems from Singapore. So we would love to see uh, more uh, interaction uh, with, with PSA. PSA has a huge role to play. Um, as you mentioned, Kim Pong, you're, you're active in 26 countries. Anything you do in Singapore has, is like a beacon, okay, in the port industry worldwide. Um, and so you can become a showcase in Singapore for any kind of decarbonization project, which then can roll out uh, in 26 countries. And that would be a great uh, you know, achievement uh, for a Singapore uh, originated company. Thanks, Taras. And I think I also agree with you that you know, the deep tech uh, investor scene could be a little bit more robust in Singapore. Um, Definitely, the investors will trend towards, and being an investor myself, will trend towards where the money is made. Uh, sometimes, I, sometimes I wish I'd, I, I, I created a gaming chair company. 
<laughs> and you would be rich by now, or be richer <laughs> by now. <That's> right. <laughs> okay, um, I think uh, for, for Kim Pong and King Boon, I've got this question relating to an agreement, uh, an MOU that was signed uh, in last March, uh, together with uh, two Japanese companies on pioneering ways to utilize hydrogen as a viable low carbon green energy source in Singapore. Uh, and I would just like to get uh, the feedback from both of you as to the, uh, you know, the where, where are you at with the MOU um, and what is the, you know, what, what do you plan or foresee is going to happen in the next uh, few years and on the basis of this uh, collaboration? Uh, maybe King Boon, you can start first. Okay, sure. So uh, I will say there are two portions that uh, in being discussed. One is how, like, like what uh, Kim Pong mentioned, right? Uh, we, we, we have good technology, but we have to, uh, it's still early stage, we need to test bail it. So one key thing here is that how to test bail it in Singapore conditions. So that's something that we are working on together with the whole consortium. The other one is that, uh, are we able to further reduce the so-called the cost Based from the generation or conversion or reconversion point of view. So there is another effort that from the R&D point of view, we are trying to work together and develop the R&D plan for that. Um, to me is that subsequently, which is more important is that how to commercialize it and put it into an actual business. So that is something that I'm looking forward for further discussion with the consortium partners to see how we can uh, after the test bidding, knowing the, all the techno horns assessment, hopefully in the near future, we can start the commercialization uh, business FID kind of discussion very, very soon. Yeah. Kim Pong? Yes, I uh, just uh, unmute myself first. So um, in fact, Kim Boon has uh, shared uh, most of the points. I, I will just put it from a, a layman uh, perspective. Um, this, this collaboration requires everybody's uh, expertise to uh, come in. So each uh, one of us have to play our role. And um, uh, Sam Corp, uh, Giona, uh, all of them have uh, very strong uh, capabilities in the research and the, uh, the extraction, uh, even the stability of the storage. So, so I, I see like the, um, you know, the tooling is actually going to, it sounds like a sponge absorbing all the hydrogen put into the tooling. And then uh, after that, uh, we will be a uh, part of the party to do that transportation, bring it to the site. And then uh, we squeeze the sponge, hydrogen comes out, and then we will use it. And then after that, we re reposition the tooling as a sponge back to uh, the, the origination of uh, where the hydrogen uh, comes about. So everybody will, will play a part. And uh, we are more than glad to be part of this uh, whole sandbox because the contribution by the three parties or the four parties, and that includes also the government uh, sector uh, supporting hydrogen as a factor, comes in very important in order for uh, this whole MOU to become a reality sooner than later. Thanks. Thanks, Kim Pong. Uh, I'm mindful of time, so I'm going to jump straight into uh, taking some questions from the audience. We probably only have about 10 minutes uh, more to go. Um, and the one question which seems to get the most votes in terms of wanting an answer is, uh, and I'm just going to read it off to the three panelists, um, can the region produce clean and green hydrogen and hence reduce overall emissions without carbon capture and storage? Uh, and, you know, it also mentions that SEMCOP is involved in a net zero T site in the UK. Uh, is Singapore Inc. also looking at net zero Singapore or net zero ASEAN? And um, maybe Ken Woon, you can say a few words on that. I'm pretty sure we don't have a net zero ASEAN, but I'm not. I think Singapore might have, but uh, you probably know more about it than myself. Um, as far as I know, uh, no, Singapore don't have a net zero. We have mm -hmm. a 2050 target of 33 million ton, which mm -hmm. is percent of uh, the reference point in 2017, if I remember wrongly. So mm -hmm. uh, that is not considered net zero. We still are having this 33 tons of CO2 per year by 2050. At least that is from the target point of view. Uh, to to go back to the questions on can this region produce net uh, so-called carbon neutral uh, uh, energy, the answer is definitely yes, right? Can this region will be able to supply green H2 or green electrons to the surrounding countries within this region for ASEAN? 
the answer and, and sufficient in, uh, uh, energy for the future growth, business as usual, future growth, the answer uh, to me, this answer is yes. But we have to look at the hurdle, right? The first hurdle is obviously policy. How are we going to import, uh, be it from the H2 point of view for, or from the green electrons point of view, right? So that, 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 that is a uh, key. And of course, we also need to make sure that uh, the, from the policy and the cost point of view, these two must be working hand in hand. So there are certain hurdles that we are working very closely with various government agencies locally as well as overseas to overcome it. Uh, the first step that what uh, EMA is going to do as what announced by Min Chan is there will be a tender by this qu next quarter to import green electrons from Malaysia, for example. So this will be a, a the, the step is already planned. Uh, whether it is enough, the answer is obviously we encourage more of such a, a so-called effort from government and industry, but we can see that all this effort is gaining a lot of tractions. Right. Any, um, any others? I'm, I'm just going to add um, that, you know, it's, it's a little bit challenging to uh, to look at uh, green energy production in Singapore, given we are in a highly uh, concentrated urban environment with not much space. You know, renewable energy needs space uh, for production. And, uh, but there are some solutions um, that we are also interested in. They also have an impact on the cost. You know, transporting hydrogen is actually the biggest, one of the biggest cost component ultimately for the end user. So if you could make hydrogen locally, um, you could actually uh, solve the cost problem. And if you want to combine the idea of, of local hydrogen production and green hydrogen, potentially in a place like Singapore and the region, one thing we're not short of is waste. Um, all of us produce waste. Singapore has its own waste, uh, organic waste stream uh, generated uh, on a regular basis. And uh, we are exploring uh, quite closely uh, the connection between um, networks of, of uh, waste streams and waste to energy uh, streams to produce, to turn this kind of uh, waste that you would anyway need to dispose of um, and extract hydrogen from this waste uh, so that we can uh, fuel uh, our, our requirements. Whether you do this in Singapore, on Semakau Island, or whether you do this uh, in the region, in Malaysia, um, that's, a, that's a question, but I think that's maybe a clue uh, for us all to, to explore more deeply. Kim Pong, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I'll, I'll just share a very quick uh, perspective. In fact, um, the point brought up by Taras about waste is actually uh, quite key. Because when we look at uh, the whole sustainability, we are talking about circular economy and there are actually five components, food, water, waste, energy materials. In fact, we have to address all these uh, five components. And uh, to be just pure self-sufficient uh, to produce hydrogen uh, without uh, taking into consideration of the other factors is, is a bit uh, challenging. So we definitely need uh, multiple parties uh, coming in. And whether the region will become uh, net zero or not, um, my, my, my thinking is this, we need multiple vectors to come in and not just from uh, one single vector. Uh, there are, what are the raw materials within the region? I, I just pluck off the air, say biofuel. Is, is that also an alternative? Is that a, a transitional alternative besides just about hydrogen? And uh, indeed, uh, at the current challenge that uh, we have uh, understood and uh, Phase is indeed the storage as well as the transportation of hydrogen. So while we move towards that direction fast, we need to find means to at least reduce the scope two or scope one and use transitions fewer, which may have actually uh, some matured uh, life cycle of technology available and move towards that. If, if we are trying to push for a moon, moonshot straight away to a hydrogen, I think... Um, uh, the uh, 2050 or even 20, uh, the 2030 or even 2050 uh, time frame is going to be very, very challenging. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kim Pong. Um, there's another question there and it's specific to Taras, but I think uh, to a certain extent, all three of you have sort of answered this already uh, in your replies, but I'm going to pose it anyway because it was the highest voted. Uh, Taras, how attractive is hydrogen now economically? 
Well, over, currently, over today, you already have use cases where hydrogen is, is attractive. Okay, mm -hmm. the key is that it's not attractive in every single use case. Okay, um, and it's 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 the most important for for people like us. Um, is to understand where it makes sense and where it doesn't make sense, okay? Um, it already makes sense for heavy vehicle transport right now, okay? It already makes sense, and, and then you have to consider the transition, right? It's okay to start with, with gray hydrogen even uh, at this moment and look to transition gradually towards green hydrogen as the cost of green hydrogen go down, okay? Um, so that's the kind of approach that is taken because you've got to break the conundrum and you've got always to start somewhere. Um, so, yeah, and when it comes to my air mobility trajectory, um, the cost of, of hydrogen is not as much of a factor as, um, as the weight is the biggest uh, challenge. So for me, in, in my specific area of, of application or use case, reducing the weight of, um, of energy storage within an electric uh, flying platform, for example, um, is the most important criteria for our customers. Um, and hydrogen can do that. So again, uh, is it a, a be all end all solution? Are we going to switch all of our automobiles to, to you know, passenger cars to hydrogen? I don't think so. I think it's going to start with a few uh, you know, niche applications, which are typically in the commercial space, fleets, typically switching fleets over to from diesel to hydrogen, um, where we are also in uh, the state of innovating on the business model. So it's not just about the technology model, it's really about the business model um, and trying to be smart about it. If there is a TCO advantage of using hydrogen in heavy vehicles, then why don't we just make it very easy for the end user and simply replace their diesel uh, fleets with hydrogen fleets at no extra cost to the end user. And this is something that Hyzon is doing at the moment. Um, King Boon or Kim Pong, do you have anything to add to that? If, if not, then I'll just uh, jump to the, probably we can just do one more question uh, for all of you. And I'm not sure whether or not uh, there's something that we can answer at this stage. Uh, the question is regarding the world supply chain of hydrogen H2, what is the best option between liquid hydrogen, ammonia, and its H2 decracking or organic carriers? It's a little bit of a technical uh, question, so I'm not sure whether you, that's a question okay, that um, you wish to answer. Yeah. Um, maybe I jump in here. Mm -hmm. So to, there are a few level to look at when you come to, before you reach the commercialization, right? Mm. So we, we can from the scientific point of view, and then we start talking about engineering, operation, financial, then that become a business. So scientific is still a very small part, even though it's a very important part to make sure that the eventual technology and commercialization can stand for a longer period. Mm. So that is, that is uh, my, my caution here when I mentioned uh, what we asked, what we have found out based on our internal study. So from a uh, uh, cyclical energy uh, uh, study point of view, all right, liquid H2, ammonia, as well as uh, LOHC, specifically on uh, be it uh, DBT or MCH, right? Uh, based on our number indicated if, uh, here, uh, what we realize is that uh, LOHC apparently from the uh, cyclical energetic uh, uh, conditions point of view, H2 to H2 uh, is uh, the lowest in terms of the loss, right? But that's from scientific point of view, then follow out, followed by ammonia and then liquid H2. Why liquid H2 tend to have uh, such a high uh, so-called loss is, is due to uh, every day we are still looking at, at liquid H2 condition. If we are not able to capture the blow off, the blow off can be as high as one to 3% per day basis. That's a very scary, that's a huge risk. Okay, but that's from the scientific and the engineering point of view. But um, obviously there are some study based on uh, Bloomberg New Energy also indicated that conversion and reconversion case by case at different location, you know, they have a range and so on. So that study somehow coincide with our scientific when we did the calculation. Having said that, having said that, 
if we were to look at the application point of view, we do not need to crack ammonia, for example. From the application point of view, we may not need to regasify the liquid H2 point of view, while we'll make sure that we shorten uh, uh, some of the transportation requirement or to reduce the blow off loss. And that's where the engineering and further O&M expertise have to come in. I always mention that from the technology point of view, it is only like 10, 15% of the successful story of a business, of a new tech business or a big tech business, right? It's the business model, it's the O&M effort that eventually we, we have to come together and then make it work, right? So um, it is not an easy questions to answer, but I'm trying to use uh, with some uh, conditions, blah, 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 blah. But from the scientific point of view, my answer is yes, it seems to be ROHC as uh, some leading edge, but there are a lot of buts in between. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Ken Boon. Uh, and thank you very much to the three panelists. Um, we have unfortunately run out of time. There are actually a lot of questions uh, that we couldn't pose to you, uh, but obviously I'm mindful that you know, you've got other uh, commitments as well. I thank all of all the audience for attending this. Uh, in fact, nearly everyone has stayed on all the way to the end. Uh, I'm going to hand the time back now to Raymond to wrap up. Thanks, Louis. Great interaction with the speakers, and there are really many great points that have been brought up from everyone. I hope the audience did manage to have a deeper understanding of the applications of hydrogen and its potential of being a cleaner form of energy for the future of Singapore. As mentioned by Xianhui, unfortunately, we were not able to answer all the questions, but it is still great to see that there is so much interest in the area. That being said, I would like to represent SG Innovate to thank all the attendees who have stayed with us till now. And a big thank you to all our speakers, uh, Terrace, Kim Pong, and last but not least, King Boon for the great insights and discussion points shared. Uh, for the attendees, do keep a lookout for our post-event mail, which will quickly we contain the recording of this session and do reach out to us at events at sgnovate.com if you'd like to connect with any of our speakers or to have a chat with us for collaboration opportunities. Do also remember to give us your post-event feedback when you exit the webinar or through the post-event mail as well. With that, this is Wei Min signing out from this webinar. Hope that everyone have a great day ahead. Stay safe, stay healthy. Hope to have you again with our next webinar session. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cool. Thank you. Bye-bye.